You can just DM them a lot. In 2022, you can say, hey, I really love Brent. And here's a, before you even do that, like a lot of times, y'all might not even notice it. I'll post something in my story and I'll shadow tag you, right? So that the brand can look back and be like, well, she's posted it three times. So when I go and say, hey, oh my gosh, I'm such a big fan of this brand and I posted a few times and I got such great feedback on it. She just told them like, hey, who do I need to send my deck to, my media kit to, depending on what your angle is. Hello, everyone. I'm the host, Kosh. This is the Creative Breakthrough Podcast. This podcast was created to eliminate the starving artists and give creatives the codes to build community, otherwise known as audience, cash flow, and make a living doing what they love. So today I have the lovely Ashley Marietta. Woo. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate you turning your Instagram back on for this podcast. I did for real. So, for, so first, I want to know, because I don't think, well, I do know this, but I don't think everybody knows. Where does Marietta come from? Like, what is the Ashley mean? I don't think I've ever, like, like publicly told the story. I just, like, tell people who ask. I came from college. I went briefly through the first year to Albany State, and I felt like people were always like, where are you from? Where are you from? Just trying to, like, you know, get a feel for everybody. And so I used to be, like, Marietta, Cobb County. And then people who aren't familiar with either Georgia or that area would be like, where? So I just kind of got tired of telling people that and then having this long drawn out conversation trying to tell them like, oh, it's over by the big chicken. It's over by XYZ. So I just eventually was like, I'm from Atlanta. And then one day this guy was like, okay, cool. What part? And like completely tried me up. He was so mad that I said Atlanta and went to high school in Cobb County. <laughs> and so like, it just like, he literally from that point forward, we'll be like, what's up, Marietta? What's up, Ashley? <laughs> so like that was around the time that everybody was like in like Instagram names, Twitter names. And so it was going to be like high class ass or some other shit. And that were all- I think you made the right choice. Yeah, I mean, hey, it worked. It was, it wasn't my choice. I just knew people would remember me. Like I know people from campus would be like, oh, that's like, it's so many Ashley's, but like which one they know, like Marietta. And I didn't expect to even have like a forward facing career. So now it's just like, it's too late to change it. It's too familiar. No one right. knows like my government name. Is. Okay. So that was a great introduction to the name. For the people who are unfamiliar with you, how would you describe yourself in one sentence? Oh God, in one sentence. I'm not capable of doing that. I like to ramble. But essentially, I tell people brand marketing catalyst because it builds a better connotation and professional problem solver because ultimately that's what it boils down to. I know in the past people have like seen me host and stuff and I still love doing that. But like on the professional side, what I spend a majority of my time doing is brand marketing and just basically creating solutions for different businesses, usually in the business of growth marketing and retention. So that's been, you know, the, prof the professional side, the money maker. Yeah, we can get into that further in the conversation because I want to know more about what that looks like now. Okay, so then how would you describe yourself in one word? I'm going to say vibrant for now. Okay. I'm like pretty much, you know, a joyful, happy, loving person. So we'll yeah, I would that. agree with that. For the time that I've known you, yes. Period. Um, when do you think you achieved your first creative breakthrough? I think my first creative breakthrough was like maybe 10 years ago at this point, which is hilarious. And that's also, we can talk about it later, but what kind of made me like reevaluate my career choices or what I want to do moving forward and how I want to position myself moving forward. But definitely, I say, I can't remember if it was 2012 or 2013. Like up until that point, I had been doing like journalism gigs, hosting, red carpets, things that were really fun, but I just felt like something was missing and I wanted to be more involved creatively. And I was really like obsessed with the concept of like community, bringing people together. And I wanted to do an event. So she and I kind of got together and did this brunch that was with Karen Sybil. And it ended up being like 200 people. It was a beautiful afternoon, sold out. We actually sold like standing room tickets. And for my first event to like book Karen Sybil, have like a sponsor, fill out the venue, that like, I kind of was just experimenting and just wanted to see and learn. And for it to be so successful, it taught me that you literally can do whatever you want to do in due time. It's just about having the confidence to do it and then pulling together whatever resources you want to do. So I would say that was like my first breakthrough because I thought there was like rules and like there's all these gatekeepers and all this X, Y, Z. And it's like, oh, I can just do what I want to do. Like literally no one's stopping me but myself. Okay, bet. So, okay. So within that realization, is that something that you still would take on today, like experiential? Oh, okay. 
hell yes. I want to. I think it's just because you and I, obviously, you and I do stuff mm-hmm. that's great. And I've just done stuff here and it's friends that I want to kind of facilitate stuff for. But I think the biggest thing was like, I kind of took a break around the time like the pandemic hit and did like this pivot to digital. Since then, I've been like so heavy into like strategy and like content and communication because that's where the money was. And it was like, we weren't in a recession, but it was COVID proof at the time. So absolutely something like that's my goal for, I think, 2023 is to get back in more of a creative, like forward facing space and take more risk. We're taking risk all 2023. So absolutely. Lit. Okay. And do you, can you talk about any of those? Can I talk about the 2023 stuff? I'd rather not because I'm really big on not jinxing stuff. And I also feel like I've learned like how to put together a campaign and a rollout. And I really want people to see it through my lens and not like anticipate it through their own warped connotation. Like we'll get there. Well, Well, that happens a little bit regardless, but I understand what you're saying. It's the inevitable, but you know, that's me obsessing over perfection in the interval. Right. Yeah. Facts. Well, your last event that I was at was good. I don't know if that was the last one, but I think it was. Not the last one, but the one I was definitely kind of the most proud of because as you know, like health and wellness is something that's very important to me. So all the other stuff I've done because of either like money or like it was a good look or someone asked me to, but that one was like, that's something I really wanted to do. And I got to do it with friends. So I very much enjoyed myself. And I don't know if anybody who's in the live was a part of that experience, but we had a good time and yeah. Yeah, it was very relaxing. It was very relaxing. And there was a lot of good food, so that was good. And people were not weird. People were not weird. Okay, so you already told me what the first creative breakthrough looked like for you, but as you transitioned into digital, you've kind of done to varying degrees, as far as I understand, for probably the last five years. And digital? right. Yeah, I guess more so in the last five years for sure, but definitely aggressively since 2019. It's when it was like, even before the pandemic, it's like I kind of anticipated people were going to ship the digital and then it just became like a, you can't deny it, you have to do it now. Absolutely. And what did you, so from 2019 to now, what did you fail at as you built that? You got the specific question, the one that made you like reflect inward. (laughs) What did I fail at from 2019 till now? That's a really good question. And damn, I wasn't trying to get all up in my my spirit. I think I failed at I would being transparent, and I feel like obviously a lot of us do. Maybe consistency. You know me. I'm a slow burn. I like to slowly chug along. And it was my first time just seeing like so many changes. Like the world was changing. The media landscape was changing client demand was changing like every I think I've never experienced that much of a like shift all at once and I have this thing where it's like I don't like to put things out until it feels like I have a full understanding of things and my only regret for that space was just like not learning in real time like feeling like I had to retract learn and then come back out and it's like girl just fucking you know you just gotta do it just as you go it's like my biggest thing for the year moving forward is like get over perfectionism so I think that's probably no, that's good. consistency is the biggest thing. Because when we, when I've done stuff and when any of my partners or any of the people that I've worked with, we've done stuff, it's been great. But I just wish it was at a more consistent base. And, but that's because of perfectionism, right? Yeah, we can call it that. <laughs> From somewhere in that room. Okay. Okay. In that pocket. Okay. So in relation to the demand, can you talk more about what that looked like? As far as 2019 or? Well, you were saying as soon as the world was shifting, you were looking at everything, the demand increased. So what did that look like for you specifically? For me, man, I got pulled into being more of a content creator than I expected to be. Mm. There were so many more brand partnerships. Like, obviously I've been on both sides, right? Like I've been the one like vetting influencers and putting together the the campaigns and XYZ running them and pulling people in. But I've also been like the person who got contracted for stuff. And I think like right around the ship that was like COVID, there was like more, uh, obviously everything's digital. So there's more of a demand for user generated content, more of a space for people of color because there was kind of that whole like, what was that? I think that was like June, 2020, where a lot of businesses were getting outed for just like their lack of diversity. So the demand was definitely like, I love 
I feel like I love that a lot of businesses started to try to diversify. And so that opened up space for people like myself and some of my friends. What else? Just anything that has to do with, you know, like content. And the beautiful thing is you didn't have to be a influencer. You just had to know how to make good content and how to like position yourself and be very self-aware in your positioning because, you know, it's not just about the money. It's about aligning with the right brand. So Right. Yeah. And being who you are. That leads me to my next question. So you kind of touched on it right there, but like, what were some of the strategies that you implemented to break through in that space? Break through, I'm assuming we're talking more so like brand partnerships. Man, strategy, I guess you could say positioning myself as more of a content creator. So I didn't have to always be like, you know, like some days I just don't feel like being present. That's just <laughs> and I learned that a lot of companies don't even need you like, Obviously, they're looking for people with a platform, but there's also like a high demand for people who can just make good work, good concerts. So you can be a photographer. Obviously, Kasha is like a huge space for yourself. You don't have to necessarily present yourself. You just have to be able to round up the content and deliver it on time and professionally. So that was a big strategy with that little soft pivot. So I didn't have to always like get on camera, be hair and makeup. As I got more demand, I actually felt like I started like declining stuff because mm. I didn't have the capacity to do it all. And it was always like a goal of mine to like, let me not go there. But anywho. To anyway. say no, just go there. Well, yeah, not to say no. I was going to I was gonna go on a whole different. Definitely to say no, but also like I learned like to pass things off to friends who held a similar capacity instead of feeling like I had to be the one to eat all the time. So not anyone I knew who was like in that realm. I was like, man, they have this great campaign. And I just try to plug them because one, it keeps it all in like the circle and the network. They pass stuff, I pass stuff. So I guess that was the biggest thing. And then also just picking being able to be more particular about like who I wanted to work with. If, at one point it was like, I just want to do everything and make all the money. And then it was like, okay, now I can kind of be a little more strategic with the type of brands I align with and the type of work I'm doing. I guess that. Yeah, okay. that's really <laughs> good. That was really good. That's, <laughs> that was a strategy. So it was like, I don't know. Yeah. yeah anyway, we, that's another conversation for another time, but that was a great strategy. And that's something that I think it needs to be said to a lot of creative people because I think a lot of creative people think similarly to how you used to think, which is, I, I got to do all of this myself. Mm -hmm. And you I don't get every bag. Yeah. And it actually benefits you not to, I think, too. Yeah, you definitely would benefit to just pass stuff off as you can, whether it's like passing off small tasks or whether it's passing off like a whole opportunity, a whole client. Like, you know, it's literally not a loss, it's more of like an energy transfer. Facts. I would totally agree with that. And the energy mm -hmm. doesn't come back like directly. It comes back indirectly. Absolutely. Okay. So that leads me to my next question, which is <laughs> how do you build community? Like how do you build supportive community? Because I think that what you just talked about in terms of reaching out to the people around you that fit the mold for the opportunity is part of it. But what else would you say? I think part of it is authenticity, right? Because like you can't build a supportive community if you're not like really being yourself and letting people see who you are. So like my favorite people and my favorite communities and tribes that I see are people that we're just transparent about whatever it is that they're passionate about or what they're trying to do and being very much themselves. Like I think right now people, it's like so many cookie cutter people, so many people copying each other. So when people see something that's like authentic and unique, I just think it's refreshing to people. So I think that's the start is authenticity. And aside from that, you have to be a part of the community because I feel like a lot of people want a community, right? They want everyone to fan them and fawn them. And it's like, but you're not contributing back. You're not a participant in the community that you wanna call on. So of course people don't support you because you're not in the, you're not supporting them. If you have any sort of like information and expertise, like why are you not sharing it? Why are you gatekeeping? Whether it's like, you know, you're a makeup artist and you won't tell people where you got your damn lashes from, like that type of stuff is like, of course people don't look to you because they know you're stingy with it. You're selfish, you wanna be in your own arena. So I think those two are like a really good way to just get started is like really start like being true to yourself and like being a part of the community that you want to kind of build up for yourself is like a great foundation. And how did you do that in your own way? Oh um, my gosh. Sharing like my actual lifestyle and just being my normal dorky self and just talking to people about how passionate I was about health and wellness. I think that's probably the best thing. Like 
when I've been in that space, I notice people just normally gravitate to me versus when I, but for my clients, it's kind of the same thing. It's like teaching them where their target audience lies and how they communicate and what they communicate about and showing them how to show up in those spaces authentically and how to be a little more intentional and diligent with like their approach to these people that they want to sell to instead of just attacking them and jumping in their face, which is creepy. Can you give an example of like doing that in a way that worked? In a way that worked. I feel like I want a job in <laughs> It kind of feels like that, but it's also like, how do we give people real information if we don't give them real information? No, you're factual. Okay, run me back a question. Give me an example of a time when you shifted the messaging of a brand. And you don't have to tell us what the brand is if that's too like intimate, but... Yeah, yeah, because the two I want to use, probably my most recent one, but I don't want to get too deep into them. I'll try and touch on it as much as I can. It's probably a little boring example, but my most recent two, two or three people that companies, clients that I've dealt with have been in the tech or software space. And all of them have had this big techie jargon, right? Like it's very salesy. And the first thing I did was like, you need to be a lot more personable because these are real people with real problems that you're trying to solve, right? You want to empathize with these people and their pain points. Like, that's why I said be authentic, but also like, you know, be very self-aware about either yourself or your product offering, because the more you know about yourself, the more you know, like, where you come in at, like, where do you come in the equation of their daily life problems, right? Whether it's like efficiency, I'm going to save you time. I'm going to save you money. I know you struggle with like I said, this is me trying not to be too specific because one of them definitely has me on a smooth ass NDA. I guess that's the best way we can get a little more specific. They just got really like way more personable. They, like I said, they were super salesy. Everybody, when they first start pitching themselves, whether it's like an artist or a brand or a big company, I notice they're like very technical. And I'm like, you need to like really utilize your emotional intelligence and your empathy and think about who you're talking to. Think about what their daily life looks like. Think about where they struggle and really talk to them like I get it. And then also like softly stitch in like where, how whatever you're offering does that. And I know for artists, it's a little bit different. So I'm also talking a little bit more to creatives. But I mean, even if it's like you're an artist, you need to be able to communicate your story and why your story aligns with whoever, like, you know, whoever you're trying to touch because you can't reach everybody. So that's another one is like, stop trying to reach everybody and get real specific on who it is that I guess you appeal to and why you appeal to them within your storyline. So hopefully that question. Yeah, that answers that question. That's like a that's like a marketing masterclass in like two minutes. So thank you for that. Damn. Because yeah. people Wait. don't know about pain points. A lot of artists and creatives don't know about pain points and a lot of artists and creatives don't know about target audience. So you know the cool thing, and that's why I always tell people like technically we're always, and that's why I love working in like marketing and like brand marketing specifically, we're always branding ourselves. It's just more of like what I do is be intentional about it or teach people to be a little bit more intentional about it because it's happening whether or not you are participating. People are perceiving you and creating like a character that they think you are or your catchphrases or whatever. So it's like you might as well take control of that and tell people who you are, communicate it over time and that way you kind of get more of the effect that you want versus like why do people think this or why don't people align with that and it's like you're not really zeroing in on it you're not being intentional about what you're delivering do you think that that comes from uh your hosting days i think it come from yeah from just like my like perspective of journalism and storytelling in general but uh, no way it could it very well could because you know, me on the content side is definitely why i'm able to just kind of get it done a lot quicker because i get it i get that it's a story and I get who we're trying to like appeal to in every sense. So, but yeah, that's my long winded rant about, I feel like everybody should take up an interest in sales, marketing and the brand perspective, because it's happening whether you participate or not. And where, and when you'll see a little bit of growth is when you kind of get more intentional about it. That's really good. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any tips on creating community in real life since people that you haven't said already? Creating community, like in real life. Like yeah, like you do events all the time and you invite people and they always want to come to the things that you do. So I think part of that is build up like before the event actually happens, making people excited about it. Same thing we were just talking about, knowing what to kind of position 
why they should be excited, why this is different. So the buildup is a big part because it's almost like dating when you date somebody. It's like, oh, I just met this person and I'm perceiving them and I have this idea of what it's going to be in my head and now I want to go see about it. So big part of it is that. How do you stay connected to the people that you build community with? Good question. And I'm going to keep it a being. <laughs> like over the past year, I have <laughs> Okay, well, personally. outside of the past year, right? Outside like, of myself, but I think with the people that I work with, the clients that I've dealt with, the companies that I've worked with, same thing, just being personable, always implementing the whole emotional intelligence and empathy for it. Because even like my clients and their clients, they love me because they know I'm always going to check in with them. And I'm always, like I said, kind of trying to create a solution to the problem. And I'm very like solution driven, meaning like I'm not going to tell people what I can't do. I like to tell them what I can do and then just build up the excitement around it. So, yeah. And then also being proactive, like when you're self-aware or when you're aware of your community or when you're aware of, you know, your target audience, you should be able to kind of anticipate what it is they're going to want, need and expect to try and be proactive, get ahead of it, touch base with people and then always service, like follow through with whatever it is you offer. And delight. I got you. Oh, gosh, surprise and delay. I'm traumatized by that from working at an agency that sent out packages to influencers. And they probably said that a million times. Yeah, it's yeah. trauma. Okay, so how do you, this is a general and a specific question at the same time. Okay, though. How do you make money doing what you love? Oh, my gosh, several different ways. So from um, aggressively from end of 2019 to end of 2021, it was all brand partnerships all brand partnerships, like literally just, especially cause like I said, there was this boom with like creators, creators of color and just kind of selling like those deliverables, whether usually myself having to service them, as you know. Like, and then I think after that, it's been kind of running campaign and more so overseeing them. Different people who come at me about like the evolution of TikTok and wanting to be present in that space and wanting more of a strategy and approach to that. People who want like anything in the brand marketing realm, like it was cool to go from like the person who's doing like influencer marketing for myself to being able to minister it for different businesses that want to learn about it and want to be in the field, but don't know what they're doing and just giving them different approaches to things that they can do to kind of stay relevant, active, competitive, the whole nine. How do you build those relationships with people to be able to do that? How do I build relationships with people to be able to do it? I think. The first thing is good work, right? Because if you do good work, I notice like a lot, like 90% of my clients have come from either referral or just like LinkedIn. I haven't had to really pitch myself to anybody. Thank goodness. This past year, I've been so pooped and like emotionally just not in the space to do a ton of pitching. So thank goodness, like some of the projects I've worked on, what's really cool is like, it'll kind of snowball. Like one company will see that you did this and they'll want to know more about it. And then it's just people... Just stay in the loop. Like people know, especially industry wise. But I think the foundation is to do good work and then not be afraid to like, if you have to like pitch people, reach out to people. And then also the biggest thing is to follow up because people are super busy, right? Like even right now, it's the holiday season. Everybody's fucking burnt out, mentally tapped out, finna go on break. Like nobody wants to really talk too much in depth until Q1. And you could take that personal, feel like you got rejected or feel like your project is just sitting on somebody's desk or your pitch got rejected or they don't care about you as a creator X, Y, Z. When really it's just like timing and just staying like top of mind for people. So do the work because that's the foundation. Keep your referrals, ask for testimonials, anything you can put in your portfolio, anything you can put on your one sheet media kit. And also don't be afraid to reach out to people with those pieces, whether it's your portfolio, your one sheet, your media kit, reach out, ask people to connect you to the people that, you know, are doing whatever it is you need to get that piece over to and then follow up with people because again, people are busy and you got to bump your email sometime. So that's incredible. So thank you for sharing that. Those are all really good points. Thank you, sir. When do you think is the best time to pitch people in the year on brand partnerships? It really depends. And I feel like I have so many friends in this arena who will probably like text my line and be like, how dare you? Well, when so is we the worst pain. time then? The worst time is right now. <laughs> okay. Well, actually not right now is the worst time. It's just like, I don't. I feel like a lot of, so like everybody's fiscal year is different, but like a lot of people have kind of closed up shop for the year 
And it's not like, like I said, they have your email, they have your voicemail, whatever, but it's just like things are slowing down, especially in the States. Now, if you have international clients, that's different, right? The one international client I have there on my ass and I'm like, please lady, it's holiday season. Definitely in the top of the year feels a little bit better. But like I said, it depends on the company and their fiscal year and what they have going on. So the best thing to do is like start slow, like pick a few companies or people or brands that you want to work with and research them and see what projects and what campaigns they have going on and slide your shit in there. So like I said, you're top of mind, but just the biggest thing is like just being as well-versed as you can and what they have going on, because it really doesn't matter what time of year if what they have going on, you can be an asset to. Alliance. But I mean, okay. And then, so back to the question about how do you make money doing what you love? Give me like the mm -hmm. gold, silver, and bronze of what people should expect with brand partnership payment. It depends. It's really case by case. That's the thing. So, so the way I do it, and this is T because I don't really like telling people my shit. I think my shit, like, okay, it's two sides, right? Like, there's me as the contractor, as the influencer and or contractor and creator. And there's me as, you know, the team member, the contractor who's doing more so like the campaign work. But campaign work, that's different. It really depends on the scope of work. And also it depends on the business because I'm charging Home Depot something different than I'm charging your homeboy. But for like a brand to reach out and ask me to post anything or do any sort of content work, it really depends, but usually around about 10 to 15% of whatever my following is, because I feel like that's just fair. Especially if your goal is to like, if your, if your goal is amplification, then that makes sense. It's different ways you can go about it. Some of them want to do like an affiliate model. I'm not a fan of that unless you are really like seeing a ton of engagement or you know for a fact that your followers really use this product and it would be beneficial. But I would say that's a good starting point, but it really just depends on your following and more so your engagement because as we know people who buy followers and like engagement comes and goes and drops in X, Y, Z, but case by case. Okay, so case. I'm going to ask you questions and then you just say yes or no. Thank you. Okay, so, <laughs> so you're saying 10 to 15% of your following. So your following right now is what? Ooh, close to 14. Okay, so somewhere between like $1,500 and $2,000 on the low end. Give or take, yeah. Okay, and, yeah. And, and it just depends on, like I said, after that is scope of work. We can talk about it. But right. at the end of the day, it is work. And I do <laughs> compensate it for it. Right. And that, from on the low end, what does that get people? On the low end, and we can go technically even lower than that because we can itemize things. Um, you can itemize stuff and say like, oh, if you just want like a story, a lot of brands will try to sneak in your, in your world by like surprising the light. Like they'll try to send you a box. And they know that you'll post it. And this year I made it a point to not post shit. You can itemize it if you'd like. And just say, instead of like the flat rate, my flat rate usually would be like, you get three to four story, story frames, right? With an affiliate link in the story because you used to have to put it in your bio. And that was another big one. Also, you get one timeline post. Sometimes we can work on more than one, but usually one. And... That's pretty much it. And you get, obviously, you can, we can work in things like, oh, exclusivity as far as like, you can't work with any other brand of this stature or you have to leave it on your page for a certain amount of time. There was this one brand that like literally damn near cussed me out because I archived a picture and it was like six months ago. And I was like, I don't remember agreeing to that, but I did. So I had to put it back up. <laughs> so yeah, it just depends. But so usually know your terms. bundles better. No, yeah, but I will say bundles are better. When you itemize stuff, they're usually going to go for the itemized stuff, which is cheaper. I like to pitch a bundle. I don't even talk itemized until I feel like I'm losing them or just need to make my coin. I got you. Okay, that's good. And then I'm not asking you to give me your numbers. I'm just saying, what have you seen for like high-end brand sponsorship payments? The sky's the limit. When I was working at, okay, like I'm trying to think my most recent like project that worked on, they had a $150,000 budget and they wanted to break it up amongst 10 people. And it was kind of up to me to decide how they wanted to break it up. Like if you want to go for higher influencers and pay them like 10,000 each, if you want to go for smaller and then break it up into smaller payments. But it really just depends. I mean, like I said, if you're, especially if your following is really engaged, like, damn, I can't say who, but I know a girl who I worked with. She was really sweet. She has roughly, I don't know what she has now, Actually, now I think she has half a million. At the time, she had like a quarter million. And I worked with her on some stuff. And she got 
a check for at least 20, 20,000 from one particular brand, but it was a really big brand and it was a really specific ask. The sky's the limit. It just depends on, yeah, it depends on your engagement, but her engagement was super freaking strong, super strong. So she could pretty much ask for what she wanted. So, so from a ballpark standpoint, because those are really good. But if we're just speaking generally, we're looking at between usually between low end two and high end 10. No, I'm not going to hold you. If you don't know what you're doing, or if you don't know that you can ask that, or if a brand is just not willing to budge, low end is usually about like 50 to a hundred dollars. I'm not kidding you. There, there's another example of a girl who had about a quarter million followers, right? And she told me that her manager agreed to a post for like 150. Yeah. She didn't know any better. She didn't yeah. know anything about brand partnership. She was just happy to get the clothes. Yeah. And then she was like, oh, and you're going to give me 152. And I was like, girl. 150,000 or 150? $150. $150. I was so like, it was exciting because it was like, we're going to make some money. But it was also disheartening because it's like, your people don't know anything. Like, they are, right. it's money to be made. So that's the low end. I, that, actually, the low end, the bar is low. The bar is in hell. The low bar is free product. The low end is a brand shouting you out. Like right. they'll be like, oh, we're not going to give you anything. We're also not going to pay you. But we do have an affiliate structure for every time you shout us out and somebody actually clicks the link and buys something. So the bar is lower than hell. But it just depends. But also, like, I just want to clarify like, when it comes to brand partnerships, you coming out the gate asking a brand for like, two bands and you've never done a brand partnership and your content is inconsistent and like blurry and weird, they're not going to give you that. Yes. Yeah, not going to happen. Thanks. It's not going to happen. Also, a lot of it is relationships. Like the campaigns that I've gotten paid the most for, it'll be like somebody that I worked with. Maybe I got, like you said, the surprise and delight and I just sent them my feedback like, thank you. And then next campaign, it was like, hey, we have a budget for this campaign. Would you want to, do you think this is something you'd be comfortable sharing? And I was like, yes. Maybe the, the number wasn't the number I wanted and the next campaign, it was like bigger. I'm not saying you should let, you know, people just send you stuff and post it, but it's up to you to decide how you want to get into it, especially if you're new and especially if you have like lower engagement. This is a masterclass on brand partnerships. Now we've shifted the whole conversation. So Sorry. To, you, no, it's okay. It's great. This is information that people need because everybody wants to do this. And they, like you said, the girl who had 500,000 followers and got 150 for a post. That's what I'm trying to eliminate here. Like that's the starving artist with all the attention. It's like, you know how to multiply and capture attention, but you don't know how to make money from it. And that's like terrible in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so with that being said for like a person new to this, you broke down mm -hmm. some of those things. So if you have inconsistent content, don't expect to ask a brand for $2,000, right? I mean, yes. you might get lucky. I'm not going to discredit that that shit just happens. I'm just saying, don't be discouraged if like your first few outreaches is like, what the hell? Like, no. Yeah. So what is like, what do you think is like the, the best practices for when you're first starting to get into this? Best practices is so just like a job, right? If you don't have experience, then we put together a portfolio based on case studies and examples and like hypotheticals. Same thing with brand partnerships. Like, when I actually first got into like, you know, just like influencer work, which I hate saying the word influencer because I don't feel like that. Anyway, it was me just like organically enjoying Instagram at the time and just sharing things I thought were dope about like my life from like my lens. And I actually did have a brand reach out to me like, hey, you mentioned this. Can we send you one? And I, same thing as everyone else. I was like, oh my God, yes. And I posted it. The next brand saw it and was like, hey what the heck like would you want to participate in this campaign and i had to like get on google and research this but anywho i say all that to say i would say make sure your platform showcases what you're about to pitch yourself to do like if you say i want to do a youtube video and they're like cool send us the link to your youtube you have zero videos or you have one video that's like not shit they're going to be like okay thank you very much because it's really just about that's what i say it's not about your numbers it's more about like engagement, knowing that people are care caring about what you talk about. And that doesn't have to be a crazy high number. And also like proof of work, proof that you can follow through. And lastly, professionalism, because I feel like that's a big part of like why I get opportunities I get, because some of the people that spend the block on me know like, oh, Ashley's going to get it done in a timely manner. 
and we're not going to have to chase her down. A lot of, I've seen a lot of people like bail on their promises and that's not a good look. You get black bad. People move from agency to agency and they keep in mind like, oh, this person sucked. But definitely put together, like, like I said, if you're a, if you're somebody who wants to be sponsored or wants to work with a brand, it's two ways. If you want to work with a brand, you have like a pitch deck. That can be a general pitch deck about your business or about like whatever your offering is. If you're an artist or a creator, you can put together a media kit and just telling them a little bit about you, your number, type of stuff you've talked about and show them the type of content that you've made, the partnerships you've worked on, the engagement those things got. And that really quickly, like from, a, from, from like my perspective, when I'm trying to find somebody to work with, I'm just kind of glancing over these things, like make it easy for me because if people are reaching out all the time and I don't have a ton of time and I just want to be able to glance at what you offer really quickly and know where to put you or know to delete your email. <laughs> so, okay, so what's the ideal page numbers, the ideal amount of pages for a pitch deck? It depends. Oh my God, here you uh, go with the it depends. Everything circumstantial comes. So like eight pages, cool. eight pages? That's what cool. I can tell people. Eight's cool, eight's cool. You can, hey, it could be three to four. It could be eight <laughs> to 10. But the thing is, what are you talking about? Be concise. The biggest thing is be concise. I, everyone's not like me, but me personally, I don't have a lot of time and I don't want to talk a lot. Like quickly tell me what you're doing. Tell me what problem you're solving, why it's important, what you want from me, what you're able, you know, what, yes. what you, really quickly, really concisely. So I, I feel like you can do that in four to six pages. If you feel like your business and your brand needs more than that to, to convey the different components, then fine. But again, try to make it engaging so that as I move through it, it's like engaging and I want to learn more. I'm not just like, yo, this is like six pages of words, no images, nothing that really tells me anything. Like, I'm just like, get this out of my face. You got overlooked that fast. Yeah. So be you don't have a concise. Relationship with people. Yeah. Right. That, if you don't have a relationship with people, you're definitely getting overlooked. Yeah. So be clear, clear and concise meaning, concise meaning to the point and also having an of what you want and also asking of it in a way that is like a sixth grade like That's, writing yeah personally i would prefer the sixth grade breakdown real quick i want the elevator pinch because i'm like listen you're talking my head off i have no idea what you're saying yeah yeah sixth grade <laughs> reading level That's what i was trying to say okay well <laughs> thank you for the master class on and sponsorships you i will be sending you decks for you to look at your deck is great first of all you didn't have to send me a deck which one you, i think your assistant sent me a deck and i was like oh, oh yeah do this because your name precedes you but i was like damn this is good like you really got to it like that's Thanks. actually a perfect well, example it's like it's very clear it's concise it tells you what you want what you do how you're gonna do it you know next steps like it was perfect like if i did not know you i still would have been like fuck yes because i think it was eight pages too just so you know but i liked your eight pages though this thank you you need to talk my head off for eight pages i like it it took a long time to get to those eight pages so if you i'm gonna the reason why i push for you to give me like real numbers is because if we say it depends somebody's gonna go and make a 25 page deck and they're gonna yeah. be like i need to put every sentence of every line item of every bank statement in my thing so i think the word here is concise i really want people to just keep that like top of mind like cool i want to hear your story but concisely i don't need to know like and then i was born on the third day of july it was a cloudy evening <laughs> and labor like right. wrap it up <laughs> <laughs> It's, I've really seen stuff like that. And I'm yeah. like, my boy, what do you want? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, and don't be afraid to ask, right? That's the thing. Oh, I think a lot of creatives are afraid to ask, even in just like an email too. Even simpler than that, I'm going to give you all tea because people think I'm being an asshole when I say this. If you don't listen to anything else I say, you can just like brand wise, you can just DM them. Mm. So shout out to the 13 people in this live. Mm. You can just DM them a lot. Of, in 2022, you can say, hey, I really love brand. And here's a, for, before you even do that, like a lot of times, y'all might not even notice it. I'll post something in my story and I'll shadow tag you, right? So that the brand can look back and be like, oh, she posted it three times. So when I go and say, hey, oh my gosh, I'm such a big fan of this brand. And I posted a few times and I got such great feedback on it. She just told them like, hey, who do I need to send my deck to, my media kit to, depending on what your angle is. 
if I have time, I'll do a LinkedIn deep dive because I like being well-versed and knowing who is who and who is where. But if I can't triangulate it, I'll literally just be like, fuck it, I'm going to DM them. And a lot of times I'll be like, oh, yeah, here's our influencer portal or, oh, yeah, here's our marketing manager's email. And I'm like, thank you. And then I send that to get on their radar. And that's a lot of times how, like, people have been like, how did you work with Prada? How did you work with this? I'm like, baby, I DM them. <laughs> right, yeah. It's cold outreach. That's the marketing Put term for it. It's cold outreach. Of course, yeah. But I mean, even if it's like I said, just tagging them creates like a trail of history that shows them that you're serious about, you know, your intentions and XYZ. Okay. You have a question here earlier and it was, what's the best way to build an intentional audience slash partnerships? You may have already answered that. Those are two different components. Intentional audience, like I said, showing up. I feel like the biggest thing people neglect that I see is like, they'll do like the work to like create the content which is what we all kind of spend like a lot of time doing. Like, oh, I'm going to make a reel. I'm going to make a post. But then it's like, you don't take the time to connect with the people in your arena and these communities and call them into your space. So connecting, don't just expect community, be a part of the community on the LinkedIn world and in the corporate world, they're called being a thought leader. But I think also just like being a contribu contributor, not just as far as like the content you put out, but also like commenting and sharing your thoughts with different people in different spaces. That way they feel like, you know, you care and you're showing up. And then on the partnership side, I did talk about it, but I'm happy to just try and briefly recap. Like I said, if you aren't already doing it and you don't have brands reaching out to you, don't be afraid to reach out to them. They expect it. It actually helps them. Like me personally, there's been so many campaigns where I'm like, fuck, I wish I could find an influencer between the age of like 24 and 45 who cares about IT and information technology, but lives in. And like, if that person just was like confident enough to be like, hey, anytime you have a campaign that deals with this, here's my media kit. I'd be like, oh, there's so-and-so and there's your media kit, like top of mind for my campaign that now fits you. Even if it's not at the top of the year, it could be six months from now, it could be a year from now. They go to another agency, have another client. Put together your portfolio media kit, one sheet, XYZ, and have that shit ready to go. And don't be afraid to pitch yourself. It's normal and people expect it. And rejection is a part of the process. You keep pushing. Bars. That was real bars. And it's a numbers game. So you're going to, everybody's not going to hit you back. So just know that when you start out. That's another thing too. Yeah. And then you can't take it personally. You just got to keep pushing because you'll get distracted with that bullshit. So yeah, it's not even worth doing. So if you want my deck that I made for this podcast, you can follow me right now. I'm so serious. You can follow me and DM me your email and I will send it to you because it doesn't hurt me to send it to you. Tell people how the, they can connect with you, not on Instagram. How they can connect with me for sure is by emailing me because I don't even, I'm actually trying to like spend a little less time on social and just reset going into 2023 with all these big initiatives coming up. By all means, email me. My email is just info at ashleymarietta.com. Thank you for your time again. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you. Likewise. Um, thank you for um, having me. Once again, y'all, this is the Creative Breakthrough Podcast. I hope that this podcast helped you build an audience, make some money, or create cash flow for yourself as a creative or artist. If any of that value or knowledge was dropped, then all I ask is that you follow me or you subscribe to the podcast. You can search it on all platforms. It's called Creative Breakthrough. Peace and love, my friend. I'll talk to you soon.